This is a fan-generated show. If you would like to support us, please go to jamieglazov.com and also don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. All your support is greatly appreciated. Good morning, good afternoon, or good whatever it is, wherever you may be. This is another Daniel Greenfield moment on the Glazov Gang. Today we're here to talk about the most victimized, oppressed, deprived, trodden under, downtrodden person in America, the most oppressed candidate in the 2020 race, Kamala Harris. Senator Harris and her husband made a mere AGI income of $1.8 million last year. Um, they lived together in a $4.8 million home in Brentwood, which is one of the more, shall we say, segregated neighborhoods in Los Angeles with about 4% worth of black people in a city that has normally a whole lot more black people than that. Now, these days, Kamala Harris has been invented as the new Obama, the woman who is perpetually aggrieved, downtrodden, oppressed. According to her, if it weren't for busing, she would forever be stuck on a plantation in a segregated Berkeley school because, you know, Berkeley was just like the Deep South back then. Now, of course, in the real world, Kamala Harris was the daughter of a Brahmin Indian mother who was a celebrated uh, cancer researcher. She actually went to high school and grew up in Montreal at a fancy Montreal high school. Her father was a prominent Jamaican economist. She was the daughter of two wealthy foreign grad students. And no way, shape, or form was she oppressed, and no way, shape, or form did she require busing. In fact, there's a great story that her mother told Modern Luxury Magazine about when Kamala was in first grade. Instead of being bused, she told the story of how her first grade daughter would be sitting in school, and the teacher would mention Africa, or England, or the Caribbean, or some other place in the world. And of course, little Kamala would just raise her hand and say, I've been there. Because, of course, she had, and the teacher would say, you know, you're making that up. But, of course, even by the standards of the local privileged upper class, um, she was quite up there because, of course, her parents were, again, wealthy grad students with prominent families back home and prominent connections within their own respective governments. So, in no way, shape, or form were Senator Kamala Harris at any point in time oppressed, deprived, or downtrodden. In fact, she was quite prominent, quite wealthy, and quite successful. and those qualities enabled her to get ahead and get into the United States Senate and now to become some sort of front runner for the 2020 nomination. Now, you know, she could go out there and say, uh, my mother was a prominent cancer researcher. She came from a Brahmin family. My father was a prominent Jamaican economist. But of course, considering the vicissitudes of identity politics, Senator Kamala Harris can't actually do that. She can't actually say, well, I came from a really successful family. Yes, I might not necessarily be white, but I actually have far more privilege, far more um, of a family background preparing me for success than really most white people in the country do. No, of course, she has to be the victim. She has to be there. But for the grace of busing, I would today probably just be stuck in the ghettos of Berkeley where uh, you get five beaten crimes before you even make it to the bus station. And that really ha says a lot about where the Democrats are now. To actually compete there, you have to pretend to be a victim. And Kamala Harris would never have been close to the frontrunner status because she's really not very interesting without actually pretending to be a victim, without pretending to be oppressed. Um, when it's not her tragic oppression, um, her life as a child of wealthy foreign grad students uh, from which she was saved only by busing, um, then now it's, of course, she's the victim of a sexist campaign or a racist campaign or some sort of other ism, isist campaign, which is preventing her from achieving her full success that she would otherwise completely deserve based on her incredible record of doing what? What did she do again? Oh, right. Um, she slept with Lloyd Brown back when she was 29, 30, and Lloyd Brown was married in the 60s. Now, if Kamala Harris had indeed been this little girl from the ghetto who was saved only by busing from a life of horrible racist oppression in the Confederate states of Berkeley, then, you know, maybe that would be a little bit more justifiable. She really was oppressed. She was uh, desperate for a way out. And of course, she had to sleep with Willie Brown to get there. Willie Brown, by the way, being the corrupt, dirty mayor of San Francisco, um, whose former babysitter is now the new mayor of San Francisco because the Willie Brown network is alive, well, and completely disgracing San Francisco. 
So if Kamala Harris had indeed come from an oppressed background, then maybe uh, having an affair with a man, creepy, sweezy man twice your age, to get ahead politically might be justifiable. It might have been justifiable for her to sweep with Louis Brown in exchange for a BMW and a seat on a number of commissions for which she was paid a nice amount of money and occasionally showed up, I believe it was twice a month, to actually appear at these and sit on these commissions. Now, that might have been justifiable. I mean, you know, if you're living hand-to-mouth, you're starving in Berkeley, um, you're subject to the racist brutality of the Berkeley clan, that might be understandable. But the thing is, none of that was actually true. Instead, Kamala Harris casually partied with the Knob Hill set. Um, she comfortably mixed with the elites in San Francisco. All this made her decision to sweep her way to the top that much more repugnant, pathetic, disgusting, and exploitative. It's not the action of a woman who is just struggling to get ahead, even though her nat natural native talents are being ignored. It's the actions of a woman who was the daughter of two prominent, successful people who had actual jobs. Her father was an economic advisor to the Jamaican government. Her mother was a cancer researcher. Now, I don't know very much about her mother, but generally to become a cancer researcher, you actually have to know something. And meanwhile, when you look at Kamala Harris's record, it's hard to really see what, if anything, she's particularly good at. And that way she reminds me of Hillary Clinton, or for that matter, Joe Biden. As in, when you look back at their track records, what did they actually do with their lives? What did they actually accomplish? Um, well, let's see. Joe Biden managed to get an Amtrak station added, and Kamala Harris managed to become a potential frontrunner for the 2020 Democrat nomination by claiming to be the victim of racism. That's not such a unique accomplishment anymore, I'm afraid to say, not in the Obama era. Now, there are certain obvious analogies and overlaps between Kamala Harris and Barack Obama. Uh, both of them are members of non-American groups who exploited the African-American experience, uh, the whole story of slavery, in order to um, get ahead politically. Um, both of them were raised by non-black um, mothers who were really attracted to black nationalism. That was the case also for Kamala Harris's mother, who seems to have been far more of a black nationalist than the actual um, her actual Jamaican ex-husband ever was. And Kamala Harris doesn't seem to have much of a relationship with her father. About as much of a relationship that she had was when she was asked about drug legalization. She completely flipped her stance by going, you know, I'm totally Jamaican. Of course, I'm down with drug use. And her father said, you make me sick. I'm paraphrasing here, but not by that much. Um, in no way, shape, or form are my family into drugs just because we're from Jamaica. So that's just how how deep and extensive a relationship Kamala Harris has um, with her actual black side of the family. Well, despite that, she's forging on. She's listening apparently to salt and pepper. That's how she pronounces it. Don't look at me. That's exactly how she pronounces it, salt and pepper. And she's claiming that if it weren't for busing out of Berkeley, she would just be... Um, today, she would just probably be strung out on drugs and that she completely supports legalizing since yesterday. And she would probably have just vague memories of her Tony Montreal High School and um, her time being on commissions appointed by Willie Brown. Now, of course, there's a larger story here, which is that in the past, you, Americans really appreciated success stories. And... Back in the previous election, we had Ben Carson, who was a man who actually came out of the ghetto, who was actually black, and who actually became a talented surgeon, and who actually got to where he was based on his own talents and abilities. And of course, the left absolutely hated him and sneered at him because that's bootstrapping. And we don't want that. We don't want any bootstrapping here. And, but of course, what the left loves is these people who are sort of kind of black to some degree, even though they basically never really knew the black parent of the family. And then, of course... Um, their non-black part of the family had lots of money and got them ahead and got them into all the right schools and in all the right places. And then, of course, they have to pretend that they're the victims of oppression. Now, there's something to respect about somebody who accomplishes something of their own merits. There's nothing to respect about somebody who not only sweeps their way to the top, but then endlessly whines and claims to be the victim. If it weren't for busing, where would Kamala Harris be? I don't think there were any actual buses running all the way to Willie Brown's house um, if there were, any, if there were, if there was any busing like that going on, I think that would be the Lolita bus. It would be the Jeffrey Epstein kind of busing, 
And I don't think even Kamala Harris will come out officially in support of that kind of busing because, well, maybe by 2024, that will actually be the Democrat platform. At this point, I wouldn't be terribly surprised. But that might be a little bit of a bridge too far, even for her. Now, Kamala Harris could say, well, you know, my parents were talented and successful people. They endowed me with a great work ethic, and using that work ethic, I was able to accomplish and succeed and get ahead. And I'm actually in line to be the first sort of African-American woman to become president of the United States. Instead, it's, you know, if it weren't for busing, I would have never gotten anywhere. It's, uh, without getting out of Berkeley and, you know, the Klan, which runs Berkeley, and uh, the Reichsfuhrer, who runs Berkeley, Without busing away from Berkeley's incredibly racist schools, I would have never just gotten ahead. And you know, it's a matter of honesty, but it's also a matter of dignity. It's a matter of self-respect. When you're constantly claimed to be the victim, when you constantly claim to be this helpless child, and really that's what Kamala Harris is there up there doing on the stage when she's attacking Joe Biden. I'm a child. If it wasn't for busing, I would just I am still that little girl right now. No, you're not a little girl. You're a 49-year-old woman who made some very bad choices in life for reasons having nothing to do with being that little girl. At some point, as a 29-year-old little girl, you decided to sleep with Willie Brown. You decided to get ahead in politics by any means necessary. You've accomplished absolutely nothing in your life except, again, hooking up with the right people and making political connections. And now you want to pretend to be the face of civil rights because once upon a time you were a little girl and somebody took a black and white photo of you. It's sad, it's pathetic, and it shows a complete lack of self-respect because really... The real Kamala Harris lives in a $4.8 million house in Brentwood. She's married to a entertainment industry lawyer, and she, as a result, has made $1.9 million a year. She doesn't need help. What she needs is some self-respect. Thank you for listening. This was Daniel Greenfield speaking for the Glasov Gang. If you enjoyed this broadcast or if you already hated it, please, in any case, subscribe to the Glasov Gang's YouTube channel and continue to help support the Glasov Gang. Thank you and good night.